Talk to me about the design of this car. Uh, what took so long and what was the biggest challenge you had to face in it, making this that would work? Well, um, as you can imagine, it's an R&D. It's an opportunity to test drive and develop new technology. There's a lot of leading edge technology that was applying to the car. Mm -hmm. So just bring everything together and testing. And um, actually, we, we set a few world firsts in the process. For example, this car became the first solar car to operate below freezing temperature. Oh, really? And first car to drive on the ice road. Uh, when we did the testing. What lets this car do that where other solar cars couldn't? Well, not much. Actually, it's, it, this car was designed based on the same rules and regulations of the Night World Solar Challenge, uh, which is a solar car race that takes place in Australia. What we did with this car that's very unique is to take on the greatest challenge on the planet for a solar car. Uh, when you think of solar cars, you think of a tropical country in the middle of the summer driving on flat roads. We decided to take this car all the way to the Arctic Circle, and that is challenging because in order to get to the Arctic Circle, you're driving on a gravel road. On that gravel road, you cross the continent continental divide three times where so you're climbing mountains and the sun is low in the horizon. So not the ideal place you would expect to see a solar car. Yeah, I mean you look at the tires and you can tell that they're narrow is just for more efficiency and how do you like manage that when a lot of these areas, like you said, you're going through gravel and things like that. That's right. Well, we uh, prepare ourselves by bringing extra tires. I, I brought 70 spare tires with me. Luckily, I only went through seven tires. But one way of looking to this car, it is an electric car. It has a bank of batteries, a store of power, an electric motor that drives the car. But instead of plugging into the wall to charge the batteries, we plug into the sun. The top of the car is covering solar cells. We have about 893 cells. They generate 900 watts in the middle of the summer at noon. To put that in perspective, a toaster consumes about 1,000 watts. So with less energy than a toaster, we can charge the batteries on this car. When the batteries are full, we can drive the car at night for 130 miles. And during the day, if it is a bright sunny day on flat terrain with a full battery for about 300 miles. But still, I mean, that kind of range on less power than a toaster. So this is a story of efficiency as much as it is, you know, the technology. Exactly. Well, 60% of the energy used by a vehicle is only to push air. So the more aerodynamic and more efficient the design is, the less energy it requires. The car is also lightweight. Uh, it's made out of polyurethane foam covered in fiberglass. So it's very strong. We actually use a new technology for, for the composite. Uh, one way of looking to the technology... If you think of it as a liquid plastic, you spray electricity and you turn the plastic into a solid. That's pretty much what we did to build this car. So what do you think that large-scale car manufacturers can learn from some of the things that you've implemented in your car and could be applied to electric cars that are made in a, you know, mass production in the future? I don't think they can learn anything that they haven't already known. Uh, what's missing is the political will. They have the technology it's available today. Actually, it has been available for quite some time. What they have been lacking is a vision and the political will. So what's, what's the, uh, the stopgap uh, in politics that's going to keep something like an electric car like this from coming out as a commuter car that people could use in cities? Right. Well, this car in particular, I don't um, promote as an answer for our transport needs. There is a lot of limitations. For example, in the summer, at, uh, you only get about 900 watts, uh, pardon me, at 1,000 watts per square meter from the sun. And in order to have enough energy, uh, enough square uh, area to power a regular size, you would need a gigantic panel, not practical. However, any electric car we could be driving today, any electric car that would pretty much cover 90% of our transportation needs. Now, you can have solar panels covering covering an electric car or the roof of a house and use that to charge the batteries. Now, if you have solar panels on an electric car and even if you only get 5, 10, 15 percent or 30 or 50 percent, that's 5, 10, 15 or 50 percent less on the environment and less on our pocket. Exactly. So even if it can't be used in this method per se, it's a testament to solar and what solar power can do. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a step in the right direction. Okay, so tell us a little bit about these controls in here. All right, so all the controls are on the handles on the right side is your power. On the left side is regen. The motor turns itself into a generator. So when you want to slow down or stop the car, you use the motor. And by doing that, it's a very elegant way of sending energy back into the batteries. What is the material on the inside here? Uh, the car doesn't have heating or air conditioning, so it gets hot and gets cold. So the reflective mylars will uh, reflect heat away from the driver, so it helps keep the driver cold. It actually makes a difference of near 100 degrees Celsius uh, flight. It also all, it make a, a difference of about 100 Fahrenheit. And then this box here, this solar panel, power distribution distributes all the power? Uh, that's right. So, uh, here we go. I'm just going to turn on the kernel right now. So, batteries. 
So right now the battery is sitting at 95.9 volts and then I'm going to turn off the array. So it's overcast right now, we're not getting much energy. Uh, right now we're getting, I just turned it on, we're getting 1.4 amp hours, which is not a lot. So that translates into about 130 watts. Excellent. Okay. Well, we will follow you and we'll see you on the road. Sounds great. See you soon. So what can you tell me about the political boundaries between getting something like this on the road? Well, first and foremost, there's the research and development, and so we definitely need to make sure that we're getting this sort of thing into the factory. Uh, that sort of thing requires a lot of money. Uh, one of the easiest ways to do that is through renewable energy policy. If we have the proper policy in place, it's very easy to get the funding. Our, our government has just passed a huge stimulus bill. And if we utilize it correctly, especially in the state and in the federal government, by supporting feed-in tariffs, strong renewable energy policy, uh, it's going to be really beneficial. Um, especially with solar energy in Gainesville, Florida. They're the first city in America that's really been supporting strong feed and tariffs. Um, another way that we can do it is by getting off coal, natural gas, uh, nuclear energy, and uh, some of these other alternatives that have been driving the market. Um, solar energy and wind are the fastest growing technologies right now. And there's no excuses for why America, the leader in the Silicon Revolution and in the solar revolution, can't take the reins on this and really steer us in the right direction.